Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Bob Toyofuku of the Pacific Law Institute, and thank you all for uh, joining this uh, seminar this morning uh, to discuss some of the issues with the public opening of the Capitol and as the hearings start uh, next week. Um, before I introduce the speakers for this morning, let me mention some uh, uh, preliminary uh, matters. What we want to cover this morning is the requirements to access to the Capitol, where to enter in the rotunda and the basement, what about parking, uh, and then go into how will the hearings and testimony uh, be conducted because it will be in person and virtual. So it will be a hybrid type of situation. And what about meetings at the Capitol? Are you required to uh, make appointments with the various legislators in the House and Senate? Uh, and as well as uh, can you just walk around the Capitol after you have access to it? Um, if you have any questions throughout this morning, uh, write them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will answer as many as possible as time permits. If you had to, if you need to utilize uh, captions, uh, press the CC button uh, at the bottom of your screen, and then press Request. After the webinar is concluded, a survey evaluation will appear. Uh, so please fill it out uh, for me. Lastly, uh, for more information, the legislative website is a good resource and it is capital.hawaii.gov. So there's some information too on the public opening. So let me now introduce uh, the speakers for this morning. First of all, we have uh, Senator Jared Keokalole, who was first elected to the State House in 2014, and then elected to the State Senate in 20, 2018. He is currently the chair of the Senate Health Committee and previously was the chair of the Senate Technology Committee. We also have Representative Della Albalati, who is currently the majority leader in the House, and she is the former chair of the House Health Committee. And Representative Bilotti has been in the legislature going on to 15 years, and Senator Keokalole is going into his eighth year in the legislature. So let me start uh, with Della, uh, who will uh, talk about uh, access points and how to access the Capitol. And uh, then Senator will talk about the various uh, requirements to get into the Capitol. Rep. Bilotti. Thank you, Bob. And first, let me just thank you, Pacific Law Institute and Think Tech Hawaii for putting this together. This is really valuable. And for all of our 170 plus people here, you're going to get some tips here for how to navigate the reopening, which is going to be challenging as everything with this pandemic has been challenging. So the two areas for public to check in will be on the rotunda level. Um, that's the, the ground level. And there will be a checkpoint there um, where you'll have to check in to security guards. It's going to be very clear where there is because there's only going to be one table set up by the bank of elevators that are on the um, Father Damien side of the of the Capitol. The second place for the check-in will be under the Capitol, under the big uh, under the uh, rotunda, and that's going to be where the, there's a circular driveway, and you're going to be checking in at a table again similar to the uh, the top area, um, where you're going to be able be checking in with securities. And I'll turn the next question over to. Uh, Senator. Go, go ahead, Senator. So uh, there are requirements to enter the building. It's basically the same as the Safe Access Oahu program uh, requiring vaccination or testing, a proof of vaccination or testing, uh, if you recall, you know, to get into restaurants. So uh, upon entering the building or uh, approaching the rotunda and, and checking in at the check-in table in front of the elevators or in front of the main entrance in the basement, you will be asked to show your identification uh, and your vaccine card, uh, showing that you received two shots of the vaccine or a full dose of the vaccine if you got the J&J, &J, or a negative COVID test 
uh, within the last 72 hours. Children five and under are exempt from the requirement. Uh, so like I said, it, it, ma it matches the vaccination requirement that we used to have in the restaurants uh, in order to get into the building. And Bob, if I can jump in here, I forgot my one little piece. The screening stations will be open from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. for members of the public. And so, um, you know, hearings typically can start at 8, most start probably at 9, 9.30, 10 o'clock for some. But the building and the screening stations will be open Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Thank you. You know, for those on the uh, seminar, if you don't mind, uh, because I have known both the senator and representative for many years, I'm just going to refer to them as Jarrett and Della. But Della, are uh, one quick couple of quick questions. Uh, are the stairs going to be open, or is the only way upstairs to the floor two, three, and four floors uh, is by the elevator? Once you're in the in the building through the um, elevators, the stairs are open, but you have to get into the Capitol via the elevators and that checkpoint. Um, Bob, one other clarification is if you're just coming for the floor session, you still have to go through the screening stations, but then the sergeants of both the House and the Senate will let you enter the gallery where typically uh, members of the public sit during the floor uh, hearings or the four sessions. And so that's going to be in another way that people are able to enter the, um, the building at that time. I would encourage Bob for your listeners that because things are going to be uncertain, we don't know how many people are going to be there. There's essentially one check station uh, um, uh, at both of those areas, both under the basement and on the rotunda that people should get there early. If you want to go to uh, the 1130 floor session for the Senate, or the 12 p.m. floor session for the house, you really should get there maybe 15 minutes early just in case that there's a line and you wanna be seated um, you know, so that you can catch all of the, the happenings on the floor. You know, one other question, Della, is there gonna be, as far as you know, or Jared, a limit as to the number of the public that will be allowed into the Capitol? No, no. The answer no is limit, the, right. The building is back to being open. You know, the only uh, thing I I would add to the this conversation is uh, the reason you need to go to the check-in table, aside from verifying that you're you've been vaccinated or that you've had a negative test, is that you'll be issued a sticker, and uh, those are going to be a specific to the day of the week, so that when you're moving around the building, the security can verify that you have been through a check-in. So um, like Della said, you know, you can access the stairwells and any of the other entrances or exits once you have entered the building. The gallery, the, the only access point for the gallery uh, is from the rotunda level. Uh, but if you're moving around in the building, you want to make sure that you have the sticker present uh, so that people know that you have actually uh, entered the building through one of the appropriate checkpoints. Jared, you know, after I get a sticker, I go in on Monday for a hearing or just to go into the Capitol for a meeting or whatever. Uh, if I get a sticker on Monday, day one, let's assume, right? Can I use that sticker for the following? I have to do it every day, right? That's right. I have to check in every day. Yes. Because the sticker is good for that day. That's it. Yeah. And you'll see, uh, you'll see when you get in that you know, you can't reuse the sticker. It's going to clearly uh, identify what day ah, the sticker comes okay. from. Okay. Now, and, we've, and had a, we've had about a year to, to test this out and pilot it with the staff and, uh, and the members. So, you know, I think that the process will be pretty smooth. I do recommend, like uh, Representative uh, Bilotti said, that if you plan to come, come early. But once you're in the building, you should expect to proceed uh, as if the building was still open. The offices are still going to be accessible. If you want time with a member, you still really should make an appointment uh, and not expect them to uh, be available the moment you walk into the office. And uh, in terms of, you know, access and capacity, you know, we're going, we're going to, the building's open. We're going to try and accommodate everyone we can as safely as we can. Uh, you know, just like we did before the pandemic. So, so Jared, as far as, oh, go ahead, Della. 
couple of things I would add, you know, we do still have the masking requirement in all areas of the Capitol. So even on the railings and in the hallways, uh, those are uh, uh, places where you need to wear your mask in the elevators. Um, Bob, I think you had a question. Is there a capacity of people on the elevators? You know, people have been very good, even as our staff. We have over 500 people in the building. Um, people are still very cognizant of trying not to squeeze into the elevator. So six, six to an elevator you know, is probably reasonable, um, but there is actually no limit. You know, if you if you wanted to pack people in, you could pack people into the to the elevators. Um, and so, you know, the, the question about public access room, yes, they are open, and the public access room is actually a very good source for uh, information online as well. Uh, all, all the things that were open to the public before will be will be uh, uh, open to the public as they enter. One little modification may be that, um, as a Senator said, it's really important that if you want to make sure that you see members, you should make appointments. Um, I think some members um, are, are handling um, their office spaces differently. Um, and so it's really important to, to call and make appointments before before just showing up. Okay, I want to have this as practical as possible, so I may repeat some of the, the questions, but Jared, on uh, uh, vaccinations, uh, I need two vac uh, the one and two vaccinations, not just one, but I don't need the booster. Is that it? You need a full vaccination dose. Got it. So for, I got Johnson & Johnson, for example, so it was one shot, and that's reflected in the vaccination card. Moderna and Pfizer are obviously two shots. A booster is not required to enter the building, <clears throat> just a full vaccination course. So like I said, two shots if you did Moderna or Pfizer, one shot uh, for Johnson & Johnson or a negative proof of a negative COVID test within 72 hours. You know, a couple of questions, excuse me, Jared. Uh, are students allowed if they don't have an ID? So. Uh, the vaccination requirement applies to uh, anyone age six or older. So you're still going to need to be able to uh, show proof of vaccination uh, in order to get into the building. Yeah, and I think, you know, if you have a student ID, that may be enough. You know, Bob, I've yeah. had my, yes. Yeah. Bob, I've had my, my daughters come in and they've used their student IDs. Okay, good. Thank you, Della. And, um, Somebody asked, will the vaccination requirements to get into the Capitol building end on March 25th? You know, it's, it's not determined yet. And so the, you know, if there's one takeaway from this whole session, I think for everyone, it should be that you should be prepared for this whole situation to change. Because even when, uh, Bob, when you and I and Della were preparing for this panel last week, the situation has changed dramatically since then. And so we're going to do our best to follow uh, the guidelines that are required for every other state building, but this is still the legislature. It's an open building and it's the public's building. So we do have to balance uh, the safety of the members, the staff and the public, uh, along with the guidance that's provided for the rest of state government. We're gonna try our best to accommodate uh, and then make sure that everyone is informed as uh, you know as soon as possible and as broadly as possible. But, to, but you should be prepared for things to change. Uh, you know, if there's anything we've learned from the last two years, it's that we we need to be able to adjust on the fly to whatever's going on, right? So and just, the same, we are yeah. trying to accommodate and uh, and and do that in the best way possible. And then the uh, second takeaway is that any changes will be communicated through our Capitol website. So that capital.hawaii.gov website is a plethora of information. Yeah, you know, this, this seminar, some of the uh, questions I had thought about, but there are new questions that come in. If you leave the Capitol after having been screened, you go out to lunch, uh, can you just come in because you have the sticker? You don't have to be checked in again. Yeah, don't lose the sticker, but you should go back through the main entrances. Yes. You know, the, if you're going to try and, and access some uh, other access point, then expect someone to check on you. Uh, and and uh, really what we're trying to do is move everybody through the main, uh, those two main entrances on the rotunda and in the basement level. Okay, another question was, and then we can move on, but do the state employees need to go through the checkpoint uh, of bringing the CDC card and ID? So we opened and did a soft opening 
before this and we went and tested the procedures with our staff and our members and no uh, the the session the session staff members but if you're talking about employees from other state agencies yes they still have to go through this checkpoints right so i think the the, the a way to clarify that is if you're in the screening line and they just wave somebody through they might be a staff member of the Capitol who have been showing their, their vaccine card for the last two weeks and have already been identified as cleared. Same for the members. Uh, I haven't been in the Capitol more than a handful of times in the last 18 months. So the security didn't know who I was and I had to show my vaccine card the first <laughs> four times. So if people are skipping through the line, you know, tr try and be patient. Uh, they might already have been, uh, they, they might be a staff member. Okay, there's some other questions we can get to later, but a lot of them are similar. If you leave and come back in, you know, come, you have the sticker, so you should be able to come back and check in at the security uh, table. <clears throat> right, don't lose your sticker or don't lose your VEX card. You know, you can always get a new sticker. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on to... Um, the hearings and how the process will be handled. So I'll turn it over to uh, Della first as to how the house hearings will be handled. Um, you know, for example, I go there in person to testify. Do I have a priority because I'm there in person? Or how is that going to be handled? Because it's going to be hybrid, in person and virtual. So if you could go through that. Briefly. Sure, sure, Bob. I think a really good rule to follow is that think about pre-pandemic for all of your viewers who've been here before, right? Um, you need to think about this process as if we were going back to pre-pandemic times. And really the only thing that's been changed is that we now have this really awesome virtual um, capacity. And so by that, what I want you to think about is how people would come early, be prepared, you would submit and could submit your testimony online and that we encourage everyone, whether they're gonna appear in person or via Zoom to um, submit their testimony online and then, and then indicate whether, you know, what, how you're gonna, whether you're gonna be presenting as well. So if you come um, in person or, in, or by Zoom, typically what happens in the house is that chairs have discretion to handle their committees. And so people would have to work with the vice chair staff or the chair staff to make sure, you know, they understood the procedures in that room for that committee. Now, typically what happens in the house is that um, a testimony comes in and they're organized by agency testimony first, and then by organizational testimony and then individual testimony. And that's the way that members would go through the testifier list. So in some ways, things won't change for some of the committees where they will continue to follow that process. So whether you're in Zoom land or in the virtual visiting room or you're here in person, you have to be prepared to be called. And now we cannot give you any specific time when uh, uh, your bill is gonna come up. So you just need to be there again a little bit early, both virtually and in person to at the time that the hearing starts so that if you are called upon, then you will um, uh, be there and be present whether virtually or in person to give your testimony. Now I was able to speak with some of the bigger chairs here in the house. So that would be our judiciary committee, our Consumer Protection Committee and our Finance Committee. Judiciary and uh, uh, Consumer, uh, Consumer Protection, CPC, will be following what I just explained. They're basically gonna go through agency staff first, followed by organizational staff, and then individuals. Finance is doing a little, a little thing differently. And again, this is all, as Senator said, subject to change. But what finance did yesterday, and what they're going to try to do is, they're gonna go through the Zoom testimony first, and then finance staff will be staging the people who are in person and present. And so there'll be a preference in finance to go through the Zoom people first and then take care of the finance. And the reason for that is, as you know, Bob, as many of your viewers know, finance often has two o'clock, three o'clock, five o'clock hearing notices. And so that staging of people uh, in person is going to be a little bit complicated, but it was very doable yesterday. 
And we want to encourage folks to do both in person and uh, remote testimony, whatever works for them, because we want them to be part of the process. So those are kind of the general rules. And what I will say is, you know, people are asking about the committee rooms. I think your tech staff has a photo of the rooms. This is our conference room 329. So as you can see from this photo, um, our, our our sergeant staff and our tech staff have done a fantastic job of setting up our rooms. Chairs will be spaced out. Um, there is going to be some limit. So if you're uh, if you're there early, you'll get a chair. But if you're not there early, you're going to have to wait on the outside. Um, of course, if you're done, you don't have to stay there. And you know you can open a, up a seat to other people. You see that. Uh, there is um, cameras in the room, um, and that's for, for um, members to be able to see uh, the, the Zoom testifiers, the testifiers who are participating remotely. What I will also say, finally, I think, Bob, one of your questions was, well, what about members? What are they doing? In the House situation, um, again, think about how we did this pre-pandemic. Members are often very busy and may not actually be in the room physically or in person. So for our house members, they will be able to monitor the um, proceedings, the hearings via the YouTube channel on the house. And I wanna invite all of the public, if, if, you're not, if you're not going to participate in testimony, you can still watch all of the hearings on our house YouTube channel, our Facebook Live, um, option. And so there you can watch it. Their members are going to be encouraged to watch that and, and monitor um, the hearings remotely. Now, if members want to participate by asking questions or voting or participating in the discussions, then they will be present in the room. So again, it's that rule that we're kind of returning back to pre-pandemic times. And that's kind of in a nutshell, Bob, what, how the House is going to be handling the hearings. You, you know, one thing as a lobbyist, you know, if I want to go in uh, to testify in person. Um, let's assume the hearing starts at 830. I will want to get there much, much earlier. If I try to get in at 830, I, I mean, eight o'clock, I may not be able to get to the hearing by 830, depending upon how many people are in line waiting to get access to the Capitol, right? Exactly. And that's why the lines for access to the Capitol open at 7 a.m. Got it. Thank you. You know, just a couple of other questions here. Uh, interesting question. What prohibits someone from getting a sticker, doing his or her business, then leaving and then giving the sticker to someone else to enter the same day? I would assume that that person has to go to the table and at least, you know, but that's an interesting question. You know, the building was designed to be accessible and so it's naturally difficult to lock down and prohibit access. Uh, I have no doubt that there will be people who will try and find ways around the rules. Yeah. All I can say is that if you would like to limit the pot potential of you being arrested or cited for violating state law uh, as it relates to the Hawaii State Capitol's security protocols, then you know this is the way to do it. Uh, and I can tell you that there will be security present. The sheriffs are present and both chambers have a sergeant at arms. These are protocols that are put in place because we're trying to do the best we can. And it's not gonna be perfect and there are gonna be mistakes and things are gonna get confusing. Uh, I can guarantee you that. Uh, what I can say is that we're trying to do this the right way and we're trying to, it's time to open up. And so we wanna do that and we wanna do that in a way that's clear and fair uh, and, and accessible for everyone. Uh, I do want to add on the Senate side, the committee procedures are going to be relatively similar to the House. Committee chairs have broad prerogative on how they choose to uh, conduct their proceedings. Uh, I'm vice chair of the Senate Hawaiian Affairs Committee. We did have a hearing, the first hearing I've been in in person in two years at the Capitol. Uh, Senator Shima Bukoro uh, elected to take the in-person testifiers who were in the hearing room first on the measures, and then uh, took the testifiers who were uh, present online. As Representative Bellotti said, you know, the, the pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, uh, now, wh whatever you wanna call this section of the pandemic, uh, still the most important thing to do if you wanna testify on a bill is submit written testimony so that it is in the record. Uh, you can then elect either to testify in person and come down to the Capitol, 
or make yourself available and testify remotely. In the Senate Health Committee, my committee, I do intend to follow the same procedure as Senator Shimabukuro. I'm likely going to take the physical uh, testifiers first because they mm. endured all the humbug to show up in person. Uh, I'm really glad that we have remote testimony and that we were able to implement that during the pandemic because not everybody's able to, to make it to the Capitol. So, so I'm really glad that we're also keeping that option available for people across the street who can't make it or people on the neighbor islands who, who just aren't going to be able to physically be present. You know, the one difference I think uh, in the way hearings are conducted now versus how they were before we closed is that because the proceedings are being live cast on YouTube, uh, at least on the Senate side, there are strict time restrictions in order to make sure that uh, the bandwidth capabilities in the building uh, are, are uh, properly accounted for and also to make sure that the proceedings are, are organized appropriately. You know, in the past, many of you know, uh, when you're in a physical hearing room and the chair has the gavel, it's not out of the ordinary for a hearing to sometimes run over time uh, and there's no big deal. But the way the Senate has organized the committee proceedings this year and last year, there's a hard 90 minute uh, um, window for subject matter committees to hold hearings. So in the Senate, a health committee, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, from 1 to 2.30 p.m., that is my slot to hold Senate health committee hearings. Uh, if I exceed the 2.30, that 90-minute uh, committee hearing slot, the feed cuts because we are not able to broadcast beyond that on YouTube. The staff needs to get in, clean the room, prepare it for the next committee. Uh, and so we've, we've uh, tried to stick to those hard lines. You know, if we're in a, a vote, uh, once we exceed that 90 minute timeline, then the feed will continue. Uh, but in the Senate, just to make sure that whatever uh, people are seeing in the room uh, uh, is the exact same thing that people who are on YouTube are seeing, we're going to stick to those tight timelines. I think that is a little bit different, but it's to be fair and account for folks that are going to be watching online. You, you know, I have a question on because you had mentioned, Jared, written testimony. So uh, on the Capitol website, when I submit the uh, written testimony, and I think the requirement is still there that I have to submit it 24 hours ahead, right? And then I press testimony and I choose now, I guess, in person and or virtual, and I wanna Zoom, uh, if I uh, check uh, virtual, then I will get a Zoom link eventually, but is there going to be a, I haven't checked, but is there going to be a uh, area where I can say that I'm going, I want to test, uh, excuse me, testify in person? Yes. Yeah, there is, right? And then, you know, uh, like I said, each committee chair has broad discretion uh, when it comes to their committee in the Senate, but at least for me in the Senate Health Committee, uh, we do have the 24-hour deadline if you would like to be present on Zoom. Uh, and that's to make sure that our staff and our IT uh, personnel have appropriate time to set up the meeting and uh, account for the testifiers. Uh, you know, it was common practice in the legislature before the pandemic that if there were, uh, you know, if you reach the end of the testimony list uh, in the hearing, that you would make a general call to members present in the hearing room uh, in case they wanted to testify, I would always ask them to additionally submit written comments. But, I, you know, I'm inclined to continue to do that. You know, if people want to make themselves present in the Capitol, go through the trouble of registering and coming in to uh, submit testimony and testify on measures, you know, I'm going to take them. I don't see how that, that custom and practice is going to change um, from what it was prior to the pandemic. So, yeah, and then the other thing is people often, regardless of whether they, they reach the, you know, they make the testimony deadline or not, uh, members of the public will often just email the chair directly or will email their legislator and ask that they forward their testimony onto the chair. Those are all things that are still, you know, common occurrences at the legislature. And at least for me in the health committee, I try and make sure that we accommodate people who wanna submit testimony to the furthest extent possible. Uh, and I don't see that changing now. Uh, can I echo some of those things for the Go house? Ahead, Della. So 
Uh, again, yes, it's chairs dependent and it's also subject matter, you know, um, as Senator understands, right, certain committees typically will draw more testimony or will have be will have lots of bills on the on, on the hearing notice. So it really sort of depends also on kind of how a committee uh, hearing is proceeding um, for time limitations in the House. Certain chairs do use certain time limits, but even when there are time limits, um, you know, again, because uh, a hearing may be shorter and people could be called to, you know, ask further questions, people should be, you know, mindful of that, that hearings may be moving smoothly and so that there will be opportunities if they want to um, uh, either be questioned, to stick around and be questioned. I will say, Senator, one of the things I noticed in the committees that I've sat on, I've wanted testifiers to stick around. I had questions at the end and then they were gone. And so that opportunity was lost. And I think that's what people have to, to realize is that yes, there's, there needs to be flexibility. Time limitations are applicable and will be imposed, especially for the larger committees, but there will also be flexibility within the system to accommodate because members want to gather and get as much information as possible. You, you know, there's some questions on hearings and testimony and I'll uh, ask you both about those first, but there are a lot of other questions that come in, have come in about access. But we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But one question is, is there an expectation that the executive departments to appear in person to testify? You know, I think, I think you better check with your committee chairs. You know, uh, I'm probably going to be flexible in my committee. I know for a fact some of my colleagues in the Senate will have different expectations. I would echo that by saying, as always, again, pre-pandemic, you checked in with the, the, the chair staff, the vice chair staff, and see what the preferences are. I would also say that, you know, being in person can also assist with the questioning process. Um, and, and so, you know, it's something that you're going to have to weigh. Bob, I saw in one of the, the chat lines the question about how does um, staff for the agencies get a, a, a code in order to help if they're trying to assist the person in person. I think for you know groups and organizations and agencies, what you were doing in the past where you were getting multiple codes, you, you should follow that practice. You, sh you should follow that practice of being able to, um, to, to get the multiple codes, to submit the testimony and then be able to help uh, in the ways that you were already doing when you were helping your uh, executive agents, uh, agencies uh, um, provide testimony virtually. Yeah, you know, the other question about whether it's preferable to testify virtually or in person, I, I think the best answer that uh, Jared gave is just, you know, check with the chair of the committee. And, you know, my, my feeling is that if I have a bill that I think that the chair is going to want to ask questions, I will choose to go in person which I haven't been able to for two years, right? But otherwise, I think a lot of people will still testify virtually, especially those that just are going to stand on their testimony, not expecting a lot of questions. You know, they're going to just stay home or wherever they are in their office, you know, and, and, and testify. So um, I think you bring up a really good point, Bob. And, you know, I've been trying to think about this from a, from, from a broader sort of uh, approach, you know, we're gonna have a requirement to check in before you get in the building. And then now there's remote access. Aside from that, I really do think most of the way that capital works, it's just gonna go back to the way it was before. The deadlines are still the same. The process is still almost entirely the same. And so the real question I think you should be asking is how am I gonna be the most effective at whatever it is I'm trying to accomplish. If, if what you're trying to accomplish is make sure you're available in the hearing because you don't want to get in trouble, then, you know, maybe, maybe zoom in for that one. But if you really need to be in the room for something that's critical, you know, Bob, I've learned from you about that. You're kind of a Jedi at this. What, what do you need to do to be the most effective that you possibly can? Does that mean you need to show up half an hour early and be in the front seat in the, in the, hearing, uh, in the hearing room and to make yourself available for questions? That, you know, the, the, the new building protocols are not really going to substantively impact all of that type of legislative practice. Uh, and then if you do think that it might, then the best way to 
you know, account for that is to just go work through the chairs and, and ask them directly, because we're not going to be able to answer a lot of those real specific particulars. Thanks, Jared. Um, one question on hearings, will there be a limit to the number of people who are allowed in the hearing room for in-person testimony? And, and Della, you showed a screenshot uh, of, of the hearing room. So the number of chairs I set up, and that would be the, the maximum amount that's allowed in. But I will assume that certain chairs will have a TV set outside in the hallway and people can sit outside social distance required and uh, watch. And if they are testifying in person, they will be called in. Yes. So what you saw is going to be kind of the capacity in the rooms and it's going to differ from room to room, Bob. Um, that TV camera that you saw on the edge of the photo, that is going to be actually going outside for members of the public, I believe, to be watching. And there's another TV on the other side that's for members of the committee to see the um, virtual participants. Also, the other thing is that uh, members of the public can continue to monitor their hearings um, uh, at the YouTube pages on their remote devices if they have. Now, what's challenging, of course, is the feedback, the noise, you know, you're going to have to, you know, we've all learned how to deal with that in the last two years. So that's just something to think about as you're um, preparing to come back and, and navigate when you're going to use devices when you're not. Um, how you're going to monitor things. Again, the public access room is open. And so they sometimes have um, um, uh, uh, the ability to, to watch there as well. So there's a lot of options for people that they can take advantage of. You know, you know I would assume that uh, uh, Jared and Della, that we'll be able to watch the Senate and House uh, hearing sessions as well as the, the chamber sessions as usual. Right. Well, right. that's much of it is just not going to change. Yeah. There might be less chairs in the hearing rooms so that we can try and be as safe as we can. But, you know, in the Senate, compared to the House, the hearing rooms are much smaller. So and then the practice of conducting the hearing is a little bit different. So, again, I think the key here is to just be patient with us. Uh, things are likely to change once we get open. And, you know, for example, if. Uh, you know, if once we get going, there's just way more public participation than we had originally accounted for, then you're likely to see a lot more monitors out on the railings and, and access yep. for people to wait outside the hearing room. Yep. Uh, if, if we just don't, you know, if there's just a trickle of individuals who feel safe or feel it's appropriate to come in, then we might not make very many changes at all. But we are going to try and account for the amount of public participation we get. You, having this conversation already makes me worried about our Wi-Fi capacity. If we're going to have a thousand people on YouTube on the railing, and you know that might be a problem. It, it might actually disrupt the proceedings, and they might, you know, we, we might end up at some point or another having this thing turn into chaos. I, I expect it. I thought it would have come earlier, frankly, with this move to remote, and and it hasn't. We've been able to. To manage it so so just be patient with us work through your chairs if you have priorities and uh just try and do the best you can because that's that's what we're trying to do too yeah thanks jared uh, i didn't even think about go ahead bella so i i just want to say something because you says it's as usual well, well there's actually a silver lining to this i think we had discussed doing virtual testimony for years and what what we accomplished in two years would have probably taken us 10 years to do. So there are certain things that are not as usual. The fact that you can watch hearings now after the fact, and you can watch all the hearings, right? Before we used to actually only be able to broadcast certain amounts of hearings. And so now uh, we have really, and to the credit of the Senate, and the House tech staffs, I mean, they have just been fantastic. So virtual testimony, I don't think is gonna go away. And that's a huge oh, no. benefit, huge benefit for the neighbor islands, as well as rural people here uh, on Oahu, as well as people who are working downtown, but may need to monitor five different hearings. They can now do that. Uh, and so I think there are some things that are not as usual and that in this new normal, in this post-pandemic, endemic world, I am so excited that we now have greater access uh, to the Capitol. You know, Jared and Della, here's a question. Will a screen be set up during the hearings to allow people in the audience to also hear the remote testimony? Will the remote testifiers be able to hear and see the persons in the uh, room when they testify? 
Yes. The, the, the quick answer is yes, because the members need to be able to hear the testifiers. So right. I think in all of the Senate hearing rooms that I've been in, the, the way they've been configured uh, is there's one screen that's facing the, uh, mm -hmm. the members table, and then there's another screen that's facing, uh, you know, the seating area for the public. Here's a tip. Here's a tip, because this has happened at the Finance Committee yesterday, and this is for the agency people who might be coming to testify in person. I was just told as I, as I did the walkthrough this morning that in the finance room, the way that the camera is focused on the testifier, if you look down at your notes, your head is going to be showing. <laughs> so what you really need to practice, and you know, we've all learned this now that we live in this virtual world, you have to be conscious of how you look on the screen and how, how you're appearing. So, so to all you agency people out there when you're testifying in front of finance, don't do this. You have to make sure that you're looking at your paper and testifying like this. Okay, Jared and Della, before we get into meetings with uh, legislators, which I think is pretty simple, a lot of questions still came in on access. Will hand carry bags and other materials be screened uh, before accessing the building? It's like the airport. No. Okay. No. Uh, the other one is you mentioned that, that children will be exempt from the vaccination mandate at what age? Five and under. Okay. And I saw in the chat as well, uh, uh, I used a photo of my vaccination card on my phone. Oh, great. Thanks. The first couple days. Yeah. So. That, that uh, takes care of that. Somebody asked, at the screening table, will there be questions having recent fevers or other symptoms of COVID? Or is the concern limited to just being vaccinated? Just vaccinated or proof of negative test. Okay. One other interesting question. Um, what about access to the Capitol after 5 p.m.? The Capitol is closed. So there, you know, it, it, it closed before uh, at, at the end of business hours. Um, now, if you happen to be in the Capitol because you have a late meeting or you have a later meeting with a, a member, then their, their staff will have to assist in, in getting you into the building. You know, just to repeat, because there's some questions, if you come in and have a sticker and go back out, you can come back in using the sticker, but you should check in at the security uh, table before you go up the elevator. Yes, and they may wave you in. They may just wave you in because they see the sticker. I, I don't believe that the elevators are open to the public in all the other areas. So it's very clear where the public has to enter uh, the building at the screening station. Yeah, and yeah and I've seen, you know, uh, in the past, I've seen members put their, the sticker on their belt so that it's visible. For me, I put it on my collar because it may not be as visible on my belt. But you know, uh, if you just go in through the main entrances with the sticker, it should be fine. Uh, if, if a person is watching the hearing on YouTube, will that person be able to hear and uh, see the person's testifying in person? I would assume yes. Yes, it's yes. It's yes. Right? Yeah, okay. Um, this is a, a, another personal question. I am legally blind. And will the capital personnel uh, assist me around to access the hearing rooms? Do you know offhand? I think that a request has to be made. Or because usually my recollection is if there is a person who's blind that comes into the Capitol, they usually have someone accompanying them to help them navigate the hallways and get to the right room. Right, so, so the, you know, the protocol on that hasn't changed. If you need an accommodation for whatever reason, then please call uh, what, your representative or senator or the Senate or House clerk, uh, and that accommodation can be made. Okay, and then you, you already kind of discussed, you know, if the, uh, if the current emergency period terminates, uh, I think people just have to look at the website to see if there are changes being made or check with somebody at the clerk's office to see whether whether the changes are are uh, uh, effectuated, you know. And expect well, things will change. Expect that they will change, you know. 
or or you can email Bob Toifuku or or Think Tech, and then we can have another one. Yeah. We'll we'll answer the questions. Yeah. Um, Bob, can I say so on the question of mask mandates? Yes, people should look to see what's going to be our masking policy when the state ma indoor mask mandating um, drops. But what I also want to um, remind people, right? It may not be a mask mandate, but if you feel like you need to wear a mask, people should not feel like they 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 shouldn't wear a mask. People should do what they feel comfortable with. And I will share with you, I mean, I think I, I, I know that we, we haven't had an outdoor mask mandate for a while in the city and county of Honolulu, but it's really amazing to see how people of Hawaii view the mask as, well, I wear it to protect others. And, and so if, if you, or I wear it because I have an, an immunocompromised person that I, I live with at home, or I have a two-year-old who cannot get vaccinated. So I think the other, the other part of it is that while there may not be indoor mask mandates at some point in time, if you feel comfortable and you want to wear a mask at the state capitol, no one should or will harass you if you want to wear a mask. Yes, and you know one other question is that, uh, I think Della, you touched on it earlier. If you want to come in and sit in the gallery in the Senate or House to watch the session, you can do so but the same protocols require you have to check in right and get cleared and uh as Della mentioned if there are a lot of the public that wants to come in you should come in a little before earlier to make sure you get a seat in the gallery because there is going to be distancing as well you know and uh uh answer the parking uh, situation, two people again asked about parking. There is no parking right now in the basement. The, the parking is closed to the public. You have to park at the health department or on the street or some other place that uh, allows metered parking. Again, Bob, capital.hawaii.gov on that very opening page identifies the three lots of public parking that are available. Yeah. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes, uh, maybe a little more. Um, Jared and, and Della, can you just briefly uh, advise the public as to how they should go about having meetings with legislators who are there at the Capitol? Call. Jared, oh, go ahead, Della. Call and make an appointment. That's how you can, you know, that's that's the simple, easiest way. Call, email. Um, staff members have been working, have been setting up appointments. Uh, there have been people already in the building uh, this this past week, and so there are in person meetings happening. Um, I. I I urge people not to just kind of do a cold call or a, a cold walk in because we, you don't know the situation in a particular office. And so we might have um, a, an office that's not fully staffed or for some reason the member's not there. So you really want to make the most effective use of your time and call and make an appointment. What, what I'm going to do, uh, Della and Jared, as a, as a lobbyist really, is that uh, if I am going into the Capitol to testify, especially, right? I will call ahead with various uh, uh, legislators to see if they have uh, uh, available time because I can be there all morning or into the afternoon if I want to. So and legislators, the, and legislators yeah. are continually taking Zoom meetings as well. So, That's you know, right. again, there's just more access now because we have the in-person and the virtual options. Right. You know, by the way, uh, on the hearings, I just thought about it. If I am testifying in person, and when I testify, can I take my mask off to testify, or should I leave it on? No, it's recommended that you, well, it's not recommended, it's required that you wear a mask at all times at the Capitol. Okay. So great. even when you're testifying, you will be required to wear your mask, and if you take it off, you will be asked to put it back on. Okay, great. Thanks, Jared. Um, any other uh, uh, advice on meetings? I think it's pretty clear you should make an appointment. Yeah, like I said, I think this one is is really approach it like it was before the pandemic. Uh, the building is open. Once you have access to the building, you can proceed to just about any office. Most legislators will uh, still have their office open and accessible. We will. But I might be in a hearing or in a meeting or doing a hundred other things and not able to accommodate requests if you don't make an appointment. And so that really doesn't change. You know, that's how it used to be before as well. If you expect to come in and drop in on someone 
uh, they might they just might not be uh, available to field your request, especially if you you know drop in on my office in the Senate at 1130 I'll be on the floor. Yeah. Uh, somebody asked whether cloth masks are okay, or do you have to have an N95? A face mask is required. Okay, now, a couple of minutes on conference committees in April, and that's a ways down the road yet, so things may change. But I assume that at the conference committees, you're going to allow people uh, into the conference room to observe the conference committee uh, uh, hearings. And, and, and I think everybody knows that is familiar with the Capitol, you, there is no testimony allowed at conference committees, but you can observe the, the colloquy between the House and Senate conferees, right? You know, this is Bob, where I would interject a personal tip. You know, the conference rooms are gonna get tight. And you know, you saw the configuration of the room for hearings in the House. Some of our conference rooms are smaller. We're gonna to have to have tables where senators and representatives are seated across from each other. To me, this is where technology is awesome. You can still watch us having our colloquy on our YouTube and you could be waiting outside. You know, you don't have to be squeezed in like sardines, like how we had in the past. So take advantage of that option. Now, what I think is the value of being in person during the co crazy conference time, and I'm looking at Senator at this is like, you know, that's the time that, you know, we heard feedback. Oh, I didn't get an opportunity to talk to uh, members uh, over the railing, or I couldn't just grab somebody because I, I, I saw them in the hallway, right? That's where the value of being in person will, will come in because as we're running from conference room to conference room, you may be able to grab somebody, you know, and talk to one of their staffers or talk to them specifically. And so that's, uh, you know, uh, again, I would I would tell and suggest to everyone use the technology we have to uh, to our advantage. You can continue to monitor the conference hearings, and as some of your um, participants know, some of the conference conferences are very um, matter of fact. You know, their 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 announcements, their time their timing announcements, and so the value is yes to observe, but also to be around to be available to answer questions if members have them. You know, I, there's a, a last question, it seems, from the CEO of ThinkTech, so I'm going to ask you. It seems to me to ask. that from Jay that these re, uh, reopening protocols actually help in access and enhance the clarity of the legislative process. Do you think any of these new protocols will last into the future beyond COVID? Yes, definitely the remote access uh, piece of it and the the live access like uh, the majority leader said earlier you know I've fought for remote access for a number of years and it was hard to get there and the fact that everything is broadcast and archived on YouTube is a huge thing I think it allows uh, the public I think it allows folks who work in the agencies that need to be here uh, folks who work in the private sector that need to be here, public advocates who need to be here to just be much more efficient. Uh, I've, I, I used to joke before, well, still now, you know, if the, the veterans in this uh, capital business know when they need to be present in the building, regardless of whether you're a member, a lobbyist, and a, a, a protester, you know, a state agency person, you, there's a feeling that you, and an instinct that you need to know when you need to be present. I think this allows people to be more efficient at that because sometimes it's just more efficient to not be present, to watch the action on YouTube in your office or out in the rotunda or on the railing. Uh, if you don't know when you need to be present, then call Bob Toyofugu, he can explain it to you. Uh, but otherwise, just continue to use all of these, you know, this, this new technology as a tool to make things easier because that was the point and I think it's working. So it's gonna change, just like I said, be patient with us. Uh, and be open to have a dialogue because everyone here is open and and uh, I think open to try and help people work out the best way to access the capital. 
Bob, yeah, I can I mention a couple of things about conference just because I, I don't want to forget about it? So second crossover for bills is April 14th. The House and the Senate are going to have to engage in some discussions about conference rules. So those will likely come out in, in early April. And that will also help to provide more clarity about what to do. And, and part of the rules, you know, is that things like, you know, typically by practice, custom and practice, only the lead negotiators speak in a conference committee meeting. And so, so those are the kind of things that we're going to sort out. Also, um, the other thing to think about is that for members of the public, you know, agency people do this all, all the time, you can still write to the co conference committee chairs and the members, you can continue to email members about concerns about um, the bills. So this, this suggestion that there's no um, access for some folks, you know, like how do we get into this black box that's conference? Uh, we have all of these tools to still continue to get information to members to express your concerns. And people have been very good about doing that, both advocates and agency and organizational groups, you know, everyone uh, understands that it, the written word is still the power way to communicate to legislators. Okay, we're at the end of uh, uh, the seminar. And uh, uh, Jared and Della, any closing comments that you want to make? Jared, go first. I appreciate you for having me on, Bob. It's nice to see you uh, on Zoom. And I look forward to seeing you and everyone else in person again. We had a, uh, I thank you to ThinkTech for putting this on and for for having me on. Uh, like I said, we had our first uh, in-person public hearing that I was able to participate in in the Hawaiian Affairs Committee in the Senate yesterday down in 016 on the bottom floor where it always was. And it was a surreal feeling. Uh, the chair of the Department of Hawaiian Homelands forgot that he needed to get up and come to the front and talk under the mic when it was his turn to testify. And, uh, and so it's gonna be a bit of a surreal feeling, I think for everyone to be back in the building uh, like many of you, I, I, uh, I love this work. I love the legislative process and being involved in policy and advocacy. And so I'm excited about all of it. I, I am prepared for things to go haywire here and there because this is a, the first time we're trying to implement all of this all at once, but the democratic process is chaotic by its nature. And so if anyone needs help or is confused at any different point, uh, feel, please, please do not hesitate to seek out resources. Your individual legislator, the committee chairs, the public access room, the clerks in the building, the sheriff down on the rotunda, just ask. Uh, everyone's trying to make this work as smoothly as possible. Uh, and, and I'm confident that we'll figure it out. So mahalo again. Bella, any last minute uh, closing remarks? Yes, I'm going to just echo what Senator said. Be patient. I think be patient and be kind with one another. I, I, I am so excited that we are reopening the Capitol and that we're gonna be seeing people and talking to people and having dialogue. We did a good job remotely. I think it's gonna be like Senator said, a little bit uh, tricky as we navigate both virtual and in person, but it's time. And I do think it's gonna uh, enhance the process that we're able to see people. And I'm so looking forward to being able to, to give you a hug, Bob, to shake a person's <laughs> hand um, and to, to greet people back here at the Capitol. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to going into the Capitol. I haven't been there for two years. And after uh, lobbying for so many years, it would seem strange not to be able to get into the Capitol. Uh, any event, thank you very much, Senator and Representative. Really appreciate the time that you spent uh, for the seminar this morning. I would also like to thank Jay Fidel and uh, the engineers and others on staff that helped put this on. And thank you all of the attendees and I hope this has been helpful. So the webinar will close and uh, the survey will come up. So if you stay on for a few seconds after that and fill out the survey, I really would appreciate so I can do further uh, seminars and forums uh, with ThinkTech in the future. Thank you again and Sharon and Della, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. I hope this has been helpful to everyone. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.